confirm it's formerly think from no think from home um i don't know if anybody noticed when you saw the advertisement but we have decided to rename the series i think at this point we've been home for what nine months and we're all pretty much sick of being reminded that we're at home so this is instead of being think from home this is now the ideas factory because that's what we do in this this live stream we discuss things that are great ideas great ways that we can improve our insights practices and again we just we come up with great ideas so uh, we are today going to come up with some fantastic ideas, and I've got an amazing guest with me today, Howard Lax, who is also a confirmite with me. Um, he is the Principal Director of CX Consulting with Confirmit, and we're going to spend some time talking about his area of study. But before we dive in, um, I wanted to just remind you that, as usual, when we're doing you know this live stream, we expect that you, along with, with us, are going to be drinking because that's what we do. It's a Friday afternoon when we're recording this and we are drinking in the middle of the day because even though we renamed this and we're calling it the Ideas Factory, Confirm It's Ideas Factory now, it's still a Friday afternoon and we're still stuck at home. So cheers to everyone, Howard, cheers. And uh, we can get moving, clink, yes. <laughs> the virtual, virtual cheers. So I have my Sam Adams as usual. Howard, what are you bringing to us today? Just a few fingers of amaretto, one of my favorites. Oh, that's so nice. I do love amaretto. I haven't had it in a very long time, but it's just such a, a nutty, sweet s sensation. It, it's I love amaretto. Yeah, I'm not uh, I'm not much of a drinker, so I stick to the light stuff. Oh, it's it's good light stuff, I'll tell you. <laughs> so thank you for for coming on with us today. We're really really excited. Um, for those who, who don't know, and of course, it'll be linked in the description box. We'll make sure you have access to it. A few weeks ago, Howard had put together a video where he was describing the science of customer experience. And I wanted to follow up on that because in watching that video, I think I learned a lot. I walked away feeling like I understood or saw customer experience in a very different way than I ever had before. Um, so I thought it was a good opportunity to explore. Now, we're not going to rehash that video because the video exists. And I, like I said, I'll put links in so you can watch it. But we wanted to dive into that a bit more with Howard today um, and talk about this whole concept of the science of customer experience. But Howard, first, just to get us get us started, maybe you can tell us a bit about yourself. Sure. So I've been in and around uh, market research and uh, consulting and education uh, most of my career. Uh, for the better part of the last two, now 25 years, I'm almost ashamed to say, I've been focused on CX, initially on the, the client side, and the last uh, 15 to 18 years on the uh, supplier side, you know, working with clients across the spectrum of industries to help them figure out what it is they are trying to do. You know, what are their objectives? How do they measure it? How do they implement it? You know, how do they bring it to life? How do they transform uh, the company from just saying we care about what customers think to actually embracing it and making it part of the DNA of the firm? Excellent, excellent. So again, we don't want to rehash the video that already exists, but I think there's probably a lot of people going to join us today or watch this video and have never heard anything about your stance on the science of CX. So sure. can you just give us a quickie, what is this science of CX that I've referred to? You know, it's, it, it's understanding and then applying that understanding of what it is that companies deliver in terms of experiences, how that affects customer responses. You know, in effect, I mean, the objective of, of CX is, isn't just to, you know, make clients, make your customers smile and walk away uh, with a with a grin, but rather to motivate them in terms of their ongoing behaviors. So the science of CX is is being much more systematic about it, and recognizes that everything the company does affects customer behaviors, one way or another down the road. And since you want those behaviors to be the ones that create value for your company. And you know, by value, I mean you want it to continue to buy stuff, buy more stuff, buy more expensive stuff, recommend others that they buy your stuff. What is it that you have to do to deliver those types of experiences that generate those behaviors that you want? That essentially is the science of CX. It's the 
it's it's understanding the cause of the experience and the response of the customer behavior. Yep, yep, absolutely. I'm just noticing here one of the people who's uh, who's joining us on the live stream live stream today is saying it's kind of like a customer service psychology. Uh, and hi, Kenneth, by the way. Um, so yeah, I think I think that kind of sounds like that's what you're saying. Is there's a, a psychology involved in in all this? Yes, I mean it's you know obviously we're not. The science of CX is dealing with the science of people uh -huh. and people behavior. And, you know, it's, right. you know, that behavior is pretty messy relative to lots of other types of sciences. Uh, but in some ways, you could say it's the psychology of, of customer experience, if you prefer. Mm -hmm. So when we, when we talk about this, the science of CX, is it, is it, really just a matter of semantics is it is it important to look on cx or to refer to it as a science do you think uh or is it just kind of like hey interesting tidbit um you know i i think that it's important because there's a need to recognize <clears throat> that this is not just some sidebar activity of sitting in the call center and telling people you know if you smile more you'll sound nicer on the phone you know, yeah. this is not this is not just um, you know be, you know the golden rule. This is really understanding the cause and effect. What what are the drivers? What matters? What are the things that actually move the needle in terms of the behaviors of your customers? What are the right metrics? What are the right measurements? The right measurement tools. This is you know at the at the core of it. This is measuring and undertaking away from those measurements a, an understanding of what it is that drives uh, customer behavior. So if you don't treat it as a science, it tends to just be seen as, okay, let's see what our score is. And, you know, you don't even, if the scores aren't even validated scientifically, the scores could be completely meaningless. Yeah, yeah. I wonder, do you think in referring to it as a science, it helps to legitimize it in the eyes of people who aren't necessarily in the trenches. Like, do you think it would help? I know I hear, I've heard a lot of customer experience people say that they struggle sometimes to get like stakeholder buy-in and get people, you know, then they've got the frontline people who it's kind of, yeah, all right, yeah I know to smile, okay? But they're really not <laughs> doing anything to make changes. Do you think if if we are able to successfully sway people to to look at this and call it a science, and we really, you know, this message really gets out. Do you think it would help to create a different different vision in people's heads so that they take it more seriously when they're not directly, again, in the trenches? You know, I, I think it's the CX pros that have to first take to heart the fact that it's a science. I don't, I don't want you to go to your senior leadership and say, hey, I'm a CX scientist. Treat me like right. such. I'm going to wear a white lab coat walking around. What I want you it to do. It could be funny if they did. But. Yeah, they, they, you know, it, they could carry beakers and things and make it look like it's really high tech. I think I like what it. they need to do is, is show the scientific results. Right. In other words, do the heavy lifting to, to do the scientific work that you take to leadership that says, okay, here's the data. The data indicates that if we move the needle on this particular uh, performance criteria, our overall scores are going to move by an expected amount of this. But that's not what really matters. What we know is that by moving our scores by this fraction, we anticipate that we're going to generate another $40 million in revenue this year. That's the science. The science is linking it to the outcomes, to the behaviors. We're going to have our, our churn rate fall from 8.9% to 8.2%. That 0.7% times the average customer spend translates into these many dollars. That's the science that you have to show. You don't have to pull back the curtain and show them the formulas. You don't have to, you know, get into the geeky stuff and write it on the blackboard. What you have to do is show them the results and the, the cause and effect of what you're doing. Hmm. Makes sense. So over time, if we if we start thinking more and more about CX as a science, 
uh, whether it's a CX Pro or whether other people start recognizing that that it, there is a scientific element to it. I mean, there's there's lots of statistics and and data you're collecting and analyzing and uh, and so on. Do you think that that changing the paradigm from whatever we think it is today, this sort of soft and fluffy thing that we we tend to get stuck in, do you think of changing that paradigm and seeing it more as a science? Do you think and how do you think? it's going to change the discipline of customer experience into the future. Well, what I think is that, you know, when you change your, your, your mindset, when you change how you approach things, when you redefine the rules, I mean, you know, I'll be thrilled when clients no longer come to me with an RFP set that says, we have to conduct a survey. We have to get feedback. I mean, you know, let, let's start with what your businesses are. Let's start conceptualizing what it is you're trying to do. You know, depending upon the industry you're in, the business model, the nature of the competition, the nature of the customer base, that might be retention, it might be referrals, it might be um, having them come back to buy products. Um, obviously, it also might be, uh, you know, transactional behaviors you're trying to drive. I think what it'll do is it'll force people to be much more focused on uh, realizing the ultimate underlying business objectives that really matter, as opposed to someone said, we need to conduct a survey to get this score because someone on the board said, we need to have this score to put in our annual report. You know, that, that type of stuff is, is the death knell of all types of research, right? It's just you know, check in the box, we collected the data. All right. But, you know, yep. for it to really make a difference and to really get some traction, you have to prove your, your you know, the, the, the fruits of what you're collecting. And then at the risk of stating the obvious, you then have to build the device. You have, mm -hmm. you have to implement it. You know, you can't just say, oh, okay, now we know what matters. You know, it's sort of like, Comparing the science of CX with the science of uh, physics, uh, I use this analogy in the uh, in the video. You know, physics doesn't tell you how to build a rocket ship to take go to the moon and come back, but it gives you all the parameters within which you have to build a rocket ship. Same right. as the science of CX. You know, it's not going to automatically make your customers come back and spend more, more money with you, but it's going to give you the formulas for telling you how to modify the experience your company delivers to get the results, that is the behaviors that you want from your customers. Yep, yep. I uh, noticed here, um, he, he commented before too, Kenneth uh, was, was joining the conversation with us from Facebook and uh, he said, you're right, it's more important to sell an idea than to sell a product. Um, you must know the behaviors of your customers, their tastes and so on and so forth. Um, and I think, you know, I, I agree, both of you are dead on. I think where, where Kenneth is going, he, he commented this back when you were talking about like preparing the survey and so on and so forth. It, absolutely. I think this it's a, a huge, um, you know, it's hugely important to be able to use the scientific elements to understand what's underneath, what the customers are saying, what they mean. And then ultimately there's that piece about doing something about it as well. Um, you know, taking action on whatever those findings are. I, I know uh, it, I'll sort of paraphrase everything I hear. Sorry, my chair keeps squeaking. I need to get some oil on this thing. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's just really annoying. No problem. Um, there's this, uh, you know, this thing that goes around that I hear the CX consultants say it all the time, that um, there's basically, and I'm paraphrasing, but there's basically zero point at all in even doing anything with the customer experience if you're not taking some sort of action on your findings. Um, right. Because you need, you're not going to certainly not going to move the needle if you're not doing anything in terms of of action. And I would assume if you're approaching customer experience scientifically, um, you would be given a certain, you would at least know enough about what the customer's thoughts, behaviors are, et cetera, to have some sort of guidance on what kinds of actions to take. I, I know you said like with physics and the rockets and everything, it, it's not gonna dictate specifically, but it gives you a direction. It provides some idea on what to do because you do know, as Kenneth pointed out, that you understand the behavior of your customers, their tastes, their desires, and of course, hopefully you know your business and your product, and you can sort of figure out it how helps. to meet those two together. Yep. 
Well, hopefully, you know, hopefully, everyone quotes I, Pe- you know, everyone, everyone quotes Peters, right? You can only manage what you measure. The problem, though, is that they often lose sight of the fact that the measurement by itself is completely anemic, right? I mean, if I measure it, but don't do anything about it, okay. I mean, that's like taking the temperature of the patient and saying, I've now treated the patient. Well, yeah. you know, if, if their fever is 104, taking that temperature isn't probably doing much other than aggravating them and perhaps causing the temperature to rise. Yeah. Uh, but, oh, yeah. you know, if you don't act on it, then the measurement is just sort of, you know, spitting in the wind. It's, it's just an irrelevant activity. Conversely, if you don't use the scientific understanding, what are you supposed to do? Randomly treat the patient without knowing what the underlying symptoms and causes are? Just to randomly administer medicines to see what works? I mean, that's a great <laughs> way fun. to throw off a lot of patients and to lose a lot of customers. Let's just randomly try stuff. Yeah. See what yeah. works. A new, a new meaning to the idea of throwing it against the wall to see what sticks, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, there was that, that, uh, it was a drama uh, called House, if you ever watched it. Um, no, no, it was, it's a medical it. drama. It was, it was pretty good. It had Hugh Laurie and it. it was a good show for the most part. And I really did enjoy it, but I would always sit there watching the show going, um, honestly, if this were reality, this guy would be sued every five minutes because it was very much that it's like, oh, uh, kind of looks like that disease here. Give him this drug. Well, shouldn't we test? Nah, give him the drug. That'll tell us if it's right or not. I'm going, <laughs> I'm not a doctor, but I don't want to be treated by a doctor like that. And I think that's that's what you're describing here. And it does apply to customer experience. You can't just randomly make changes and hope for the very best. And two, you know, another thing I think is is interesting, and, and maybe this is just because, you know, I'm not a customer experience expert. I'm, you know, I sit more on the business side. I think that there, there's another another depth to this too, is that it's not always just about what the customer wants. And you pointed to this before, how we're saying it's about the business objective. Objectives, it's about the outcomes, because you you know even if you are making the right changes, the changes the customer is demanding, is that really what you want to be doing? Is that going to meet up with your business objectives? You might be making the customer happy, but is that customer representative of the entire customer base? Is you know are these customers the ones who are bringing your money in? You know there's that old 80-20 principle that you know 20% of your customers are 80% of your revenue. So are you are you doing the actions that are going to make the right customer base happy? Um, and that's all tying it back to those business objectives that you were talking about before. And that's, again, it's a very extremely scientific approach to tying together all of those different elements, making sure it's going to be profitable for the business and then doing something about it. It's, right. it's and, very interesting. And, you know, the key is, is not just, as some firms used to do, ask people what matters to them. It's, it's not, you know, it's not that people lie to you, they lie to themselves. You yeah. know, we don't really know what motives are our own behaviors. You know, we we rationalize things after the fact to describe what it is that we've already decided to do. You need to get at the underlying drivers. And, you know, I hate to sound like a total propeller head, but the only way you could do that is just through a statistical analysis. And, mm-hmm. you know, learnings from behavioral economics over the last 10 years have just opened eyes wide to how important the emotional dimension is to decision making. And, yeah. you know, with perhaps the exception of the Dalai Lama and six other people in the galaxy, nobody's in touch with their emotional underside and understands how they react to things. But, mm-hmm. you know, study after study after study indicates that if you do really good quality work, but don't connect emotionally with your customers, that's you know, better than doing lousy quality, you know, it's better than a lousy experience and a lousy product, but it's, it's only when you have the, the, the right formula of quality and the emotional connection that you really see things take off. I'll give you an example. I've done tons of work in the handheld arena in terms of mobiles. I won't use brands. Everyone will know what brand to substitute in two seconds. There is one particular brand of mobile device that consistently underperforms another very popular mobile device. Yet that one that underperforms in terms of the quality of its features consistently outperforms that other brand in terms of the attachment and loyalty and complete devotion of its customers. Because 
you know, at the risk of stating the obvious, Apple has created a cult of yes, love. Yes, they have. They and absolutely new, have. And, and it, you know, I, I, I do survey after survey. And, you know, Apple underperforms lots of other brands on features and functions and outperforms them all when it comes to the level of emotional attachment and overall loyalty. That is the right formula. Yep, yep. Uh, so I just got uh, a couple comments from uh, from Kenneth, who is really enjoying the topic. Uh, said he oh, he's been thinking very much along the same lines, and it's finally been consolidated into a format that makes sense. Um, we have Jake who just said, "Where can we find the link to the original science video?" It is on confirmit.com, but after this post, I'll also put it in the description box. Um, you are on your LinkedIn. So uh, I'll post it up. I'll make sure it's posted up on LinkedIn as well uh, so you can get to it. But again, if you go to confirmit.com, you'll be able to find it in our resources center. Um, but you know, might have to sort of wade through cause all, all the other resources and stuff there. So again, the, uh, I'll put all the, um, uh, the links up for you. Um, and you've got a couple of people now agreeing. Yes, Apple. Everybody recognized right away. You were saying the cult. Everybody's going Apple, Apple. And I agree. Their marketing is something. And uh, Jeff has also joined us on LinkedIn, and he's saying uh, Tesla is another one where there's this cult kind of forming around it, which may or may not be a reality. Although I'll admit, I got to ride in a Tesla once, and it was really, really cool. <laughs> Just once. <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> but I'll cool. tell you this. I've done a lot of work with car folks what they end up always doing is saying, okay, let's go back to the lab. Let's go back to those folks with the white lab coats and have the car accelerate from zero to 60 in 2.6 seconds instead of 2.2 seconds. And the reality is that's not what's driving the return behavior. It's sure. the emotional connection. And you know the problem though for most firms is the emotional connection sounds soft it sounds like it's, you know, it, it is, it's not as substantive. It, it's much easier to improve the product, right? It, it's much easier to deal with the physical parameters of the product or the service, make it better, better, faster, better, shinier, quicker, make it something that is more easily communicable and deliverable to the customer. The problem though is that when they do that, that's not bad, but it almost never moves the needle as much as adding an emotional infusion into the relationship. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I, I've done this type of measurement and and companies, they, they have a hard time coping with it because they don't know what to do about the need for emotions because it seems too soft. You know, don't get me wrong, much, much more difficult to build yeah. an emotional bond than a product dependent bond. But the durability of that emotional bond is infinitely stronger. And, you know, the, the fact is that that's where the payoff is. You know, you got to do the hard work. You know, you can't ignore it just because it's difficult to do. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, beside the fact that I'm in marketing. So, yeah, I mean, part of what the, the marketing department is, is to create that that emotion around our product. Um, you know, so it's absolutely, I guarantee, I, I completely agree that the emotional connection is really, really, really powerful and very hard to develop. It's very hard to grow no matter how good the product is. Absolutely. And some of them are completely irrational. Uh, but I think it's probably, you tell me if I'm wrong, if I'm, if I'm overstating, you're the CX expert, not me, but it feels to me like the emotional aspect is a significantly stronger driver of loyalty. Uh, I mean, I know I've made choices, product choices for random things that don't make sense in comparison to to the reality of what the product does or what purpose it serves or what, what issue it solves. Uh, but I've chosen strictly because it's the right choice for me being loyal to that company because there, there are a couple. I, honestly, I'm a huge Google fan massive and no I don't have an Apple I am an Android user and proud of and I'm actually a massive massive Google fan um, so, and yes I will use things that are Google that I don't need because I want to because I love Google 
Um, and I, I feel like that's probably pretty common with many buyers where it's that emotional, almost nonsensical emotional angle that keeps loyalty and opens up our wallets nice and wide. See, I, I don't, I don't think of it as nonsensical, you know, nonsensical means that it doesn't serve any purpose. The reality is it does serve a purpose for you. It's filling your emotional need, whatever that, emo however That's that emotional true. need is defined. Yeah. So for me, by the way, emotion, you know, meeting the emotional needs of customers is eminently rational Yeah. because that, you know, the emotions drive the behavior. Okay. Let's cut her. Let's cater uh, to those emotions, you know, and, you know, pe people do not make optimizing decisions. You know, the, the economic maximizing decision-making model that used to, and it's still prevalent when you study economics, you know, has nothing to do with how people make decisions. You know, it assumes mm -hmm. perfect information, infinite ability to get all the information, process the information, understand it all. It assumes that the information is even worth it to you relative to what you're trying to decide. You know, people act sometimes like every time you go into the supermarket, you read the label on every item in order to make your e economically efficient decision. You know, that's, of course, you ridiculous. There for days. Yeah. Well, and, you know, the supermarket may never put it this way, but they know damn well that they are not in the business of selling things based on the labels and the quality of the product. They would never say, hey, here's an inferior product, please buy it. But they, you know, the, the packaging, the placement, the color, things that have nothing to do with the underlying product mm -hmm. are immensely yeah. important. And this isn't new. I mean, marketers, you're in marketing, right? What is marketing? That's what we do. It's the, it's the attempt to influence the behavior of, would be buyers. Yeah. CX is simply a highly specialized subset within that domain. And it's amazing because, and I know this is, you know, kind of, I don't want to go too far off on a tangent, but it's amazing because mar I don't feel like marketing and CX do enough together, at least not as I've seen. I feel like there's so much that marketing could learn um, but or or you know so much information that that the CX people could get or have access to that shared into a department like marketing would be almost gold. Um, and yes, for the customer too. But I wonder, you know, how far could we could we expand it? Could this be pushed into, you know, into the brand and understanding the perceptions of the brand? And maybe this gets into the world of sure. market research where we start going before the person is a customer. But there's just so much that we could do together. So I think people should do that. Um, I'll also just comment too that we got a couple more comments. Um, Jeff was was agreeing with everything you're saying, saying that uh, you know, and specifically pointing back to uh, to Tesla, Elon Musk's enthusiasm connects people and makes them ultimately feel like they're connecting to the future. So that's that emotional feel is that they feel very very futuristic. I would add to that, Jeff, that I think it also makes people feel rich. Uh, I, I think, you know, it's probably they have, you know, the lesser um, rich and, and maybe high end, high class, a uh, little, as my daughters would call it, bougie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's apparently the latest word for that. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, there's just, there's just, it's, it's fascinating. It really is a science. And there's so many amazing applications, um, you know, across the organization when we, when we step back and, you know, just in this conversation, I was asking if we thought this would, the discipline could change by changing our paradigm to see it as a science. And I feel like already in this conversation, we've started seeing that paradigm change, how the applications go into other departments, other areas of the business. There's so much more. So I guess, you know, we are getting toward the, toward the end of our, of our usual uh, allotted time here, but just to, to kind of tie it all up, maybe what can we do? How do we how do we proceed from here? What's the first step in sharing, you know, convincing stakeholders and executives that this is more scientific or or doing how do we do it? What do we do to make it more scientific so we can really sure. start to benefit from this? I mean, you you got to start by basically reverse engineering things. You know, you got to start by conceptualizing what's the outcome, the result, the behavior, the business uh, end that you want to drive. And then mm -hmm we we'll work backwards to test, you know, are you currently measuring the right things? I mean, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're measuring a bunch of stuff, 
And I'll throw a little geeky stuff in here for those of you who like things like R squareds and, and statistics. You know, if you're measuring a bunch of stuff and it's explaining 30% of the variance in the outcome, well, you're not measuring the right stuff. Do you have the right KPIs? You know, uh, most companies just pick a KPI off the shelf or they inherit it from their predecessor and they've been tracking it forever and they say we can't change it. But, well, test is your KPI explaining what you're looking to explain. Let's do the obvious. The most obvious thing that every company wants is to retain customers. Are your, is your KPI explaining customer retention defection or is it just sort of, okay, a standing metric. If it's not explaining what you're trying to accomplish, then throw it out. Test new inputs, test other KPIs. Link all of that data to the behavioral data that you have on customers to say, hey, how long are they staying? How much are they spending? What's the profitability per customer? What's the, what's the business impact that we're trying to accomplish? That's what makes it uh, you know, a science and that's also what's gonna make it relevant. Right. Don't again. You know, don't go to senior leadership and say, "Hey, I've got a PhD in CX." Rather, tell them that you've got the formula, and it's not magic. You've got the formula for driving additional dollars to the bottom line by boosting customer spend, by boosting the number of products they buy, by boosting the frequency with which they shop. You know, whatever it is that's driving your business forward. Link what you're doing to the outcomes, and make it systematic. You know, I don't want to sound like a total, you know, propeller head and tell you you got to formulate hypotheses and test the hypotheses, but that's essentially what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Formulate what you're trying to accomplish and test to see if you're accomplishing it. Then you are a CX scientist and a real CX pro. It's funny, my my daughter, um, I have a, she's she's almost 13. She's She's 12 technically, but she'll be 13 in a few days. And she's just now learning the scientific method. Uh, um, and, you know, to hypothesis, I forget all of it now off the top of my head, but she's just now learning the scientific method. And I was thinking about you when, when I was helping her with her homework recently. Uh, and I did another webinar um, with um, a gentleman named Stan Phelps. We were talking about um, uh, pink goldfish, pink goldfish. Which is a marketing concept. Yes. And I, I pulled you your, your science of CX in there as well um, and did the same thing, talking about that scientific method, because, you know, the more I've learned about this, the more I, I definitely see it is it is a science. I have a new newfound appreciation for uh, for the area of uh, of customer experience, looking at it from this perspective. Well, welcome um, to the cult. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. It's it's great. Hopefully, it's a cult that likes to drink because I'm not. I'm still going with beer here. Now I've got a little uh, bit left myself. <laughs> so everybody who joined us today, thank you so much. Uh, it was lovely. This was really engaging. I know we've had a lot of live streams in the past and not as many comments. Uh, so this was fantastic. We got a lot of uh, a lot of people talking today, which is just great. Um, so keep the conversation going and maybe we can uh, have Howard back to dive in again the next time that we have another ideas factory, confirm it ideas factory. Um, and in the meantime, enjoy your weekend and cheers. And oh, because this is on all of our social media, I don't know wherever you're joining us from, the, you, this is live on all the social media. Whatever the positive thing is for your social media, you know the drill, like it, comment on it, um, share it, all those good things, subscribe to our channel, all those great things. And uh, we do thank you and hope you have a lovely weekend. We'll see you in two weeks. Thank you so much and uh, take care everybody. Thanks Holly, take care all.